There's a great concern in the sports world. Bill Walsh has left the 49ers. George Seifert is now the coach. There's always a concern that when you remove the head coach, the team will flounder. According to the score that I saw, the exhibition game they played yesterday, they didn't flounder too badly. Of course, they were playing the Raiders, and that's no big deal. <laughs> but uh, now some of you won't hear another thing I say all morning. And I, that's the only problem with injecting anything like that into a, a sermon. But uh, many times that's been true. You remove the, the head coach and the team does flounder. You break fuel line, motor won't run. Tragic, tragic story that we've all been so aware of in recent weeks. You break the hydraulic lines. You can't control an aircraft. And how fortunate that any survived in that United Airlines crash. Without the head, the body dies. We know that. Decapitation, what a, what a, what a form of punishment. Swift once you get there. That guillotine. If you've ever been the subject in some situation where there was a magician around and he had one of those little contraptions, hmm? And he said, I think I'd like to have you come up here and help me. <laughs> Put your head in that thing. And you know it's phony, but it's your neck. And you have a lot of concern about what's going on at that time. You see, whether we're dealing in leadership or power, sources of power, fuel, or life itself, connections are vital. You've got to have the right connection. The book of Colossians is a book of connections. The church in this city of Colossae had major problems. That false teachings that had come into the church, a combined ideas from other philosophies and religions, and the heresy came to be known as Gnosticism. That means knowledge. That's a Greek word meaning knowledge. And they emphasize special knowledge and they denied that Christ was truly God and truly their Savior. Friend, the story of the scriptures, that thread that runs all the way through, is that we must be connected with Jesus Christ in order to touch God. You cannot bypass Jesus Christ and get any connections with God. As I have been studying this week in the passage that I assigned a week ago and two weeks ago to various audiences here simply because of the configuration of the five days of fun thing, the Colossians 1, 15 to 23 passage. If you do your reading somewhere in the last two weeks, this has been the reading you've done. And as you read over and over again concerning who Christ is, you have to know that the reason this was written was to help correct the major misconceptions in this church at Colossae that had come in. Church founded just as surely on the word of God and on the truths of God as this one was, but here came these false teachings in. And I just want to talk about four of those this morning. In order to help you take another look, your assignment, by the way, is to read Colossians 1, 15 to 23. And somebody's saying, well, this must be something old and manufactured. No, not at all. It's the importance that we get hold of this truth and embrace it 
very close to ourselves, and there may be the possibility that some of you have not yet come to Jesus Christ, some of you are still in some kind of spiritual fog, some of you are still uh, dinking around with New Age stuff and trying to fit all that together. See, there's nothing new about New Age. And before we finish this morning, I will prove that to you. It's right here. The first thing that they were saying in Colossae is that matter is evil. Therefore, God could not have come to earth in a true human body form. And they just pounded this. And look what he says in verse 15. Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. You see, if matter is evil, and we talk about the death of Christ in his body on the cross, that's of no effect if he was evil. But that is not what the scripture teaches us. Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. And therefore, coming in that body and taking on himself the form of a servant and taking on himself the name of Jesus and going all the way to the cross and dying on that cross, he was there as our substitute, the sinless one. Just like they had to do all down through the Old Testament, you had to bring a spotless lamb. You didn't bring that crummiest one in the flock. You didn't bring the runt. You didn't bring the one that had all the problems. You brought the very best that you had, and in bringing the very best that you had, that was the one that was offered looking ahead to the perfect Lamb of God that would come and would give himself in our place. Secondly, they believe that God did not create the world because he would not have created evil. Now dealing with the problem of the source of evil has always been a wild discussion. If you've ever been involved in the study of theology, especially if you spent some time in a Christian college, You've spent some long nights banging heads with other people about the source of evil. But here they decided rather than that Satan could rebel against God and bring evil into the world, they decided that God did not create the world because he could not have created evil. But verse 16 says Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth, the things we can see and the things we cannot see, the spirit world with its kings and kingdoms, its rulers and authorities, all were made by Christ for his own use and glory. He's the creator. He is the one that put it all together beyond our understanding, beyond our ability to comprehend that someone would speak and things would come into existence literally out of nothing, to create, that's what that word means, to bring something out of nothing, and that's what he did. And himself, Jesus Christ, is the creator of all things. Thirdly, they said that Christ was not the unique son of God, just one of many intermediaries between God and people. Now, folks, there are a lot of people saying that today. They've got a whole list of intermediaries that have come. When I was at Camp Royal back in June and spoke with those kids and had especially those two Muslim high school boys speak to me. They were kind. They were very kind, but completely wrong. And this is exactly what they're telling me. There's Muhammad. There's Jesus. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh-uh. Listen to what it says, beginning at verse 17. It was through what his son did that God cleared a path for everything to come to him. All things in heaven and on earth. For Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. This includes you who were once so far away from God. I think that's a great reminder. There may be some of you here this morning that feel you're a long ways from God. You know you're a long ways from God. And you're here this morning trying to find your way. Friend, 
the right way, the only way to find your way is to begin to accept this message that the unique Son of God, unlike any other prophet who ever came before or since, the unique one, it was through him that God cleared a path for everything to come to him. Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. As you sit there this morning and think about how far you once were from God. You once you were his enemy and once you hated him and once you were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions and yet now he has brought you back as his friends. Why? Because you have trusted him. You have believed on him. You have invited him to come into your life. You have acknowledged him as the unique son of God. And then in the fourth place, they refuse to see Jesus Christ as the source of salvation, insisting that people can find God through special and secret knowledge. Now people, that is so new agey. You can find him through secret and special knowledge, but you don't have to come here. Look what it says beginning at verse 20. Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. This includes you, you who were once so far away from God, you were his enemies, you hated him, you were separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he's brought you back as his friends. Now if, he, if he's done that for others, he's still in the business of doing that for you. He has done this through the death on the cross of his own human body. There is that reminder that was truly a human body, matter. And now as a result, Christ has brought you into the very presence of God and you're standing there before him with nothing left against you. Nothing left that he can even chide you for. The only condition is that you fully believe the truth, standing in it steadfast and firm, strong in the Lord, convinced of the good news that Jesus died for you and never shifting from trusting him to save you. He is the source of our salvation. We don't have to look for other things. And when we look for other things, we're out of line and we're going to miss the message because we're going to get lost in other things that people are giving to us as truth. And we're in such a strong and powerful warfare. I, this week while we were at the coast, I finally jumped into this present darkness and read the entire thing. It'll rob you of some sleep just from a standpoint of... Uh, you can't just put it down and go to bed when you say it's time to go to bed. That book is not for everybody. Some of you may get in there and find yourself really upset. As I was talking to Michelle this morning, she was saying she dealt with a person this week that came really upset, such a vivid imagination, and into reading that book, and suddenly those descriptive phrases concerning the spirit world and the war that's going on were overwhelming to her. I still highly recommend it because most of us do not in any way comprehend the tremendous warfare that is going on in the spirit world. We don't have any picture of what's happening. And I know this came out of somebody's typewriter, but I believe there is strong, strong hand of God upon the author in presenting this story to help us wake us up because the story of that book is concerning angels and prayer. The great need for great prayer, the great lack in our lives right across this congregation is the lack of time to pray. If I were to say how many of you really believe that before God you are giving a proper amount of time to prayer daily, and told you, be honest, God will strike you dead if you raise your hand and it's not true. Boy, I tell you, there wouldn't be many hands in the air. Not just because of fear that God would strike us dead, but because of the knowledge that we don't spend nearly enough time in prayer. There is an incredible warfare going on, and until you get straight on this issue, 
The central truth of Christianity is the divine nature of Jesus Christ. And until you get hold of that issue, all the rest of it just goes by the board. Let me say just three things about Jesus that the scripture teaches. Equal with God. John chapter 10 and verse 30, he said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. Equal with God himself. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, talks about how Jesus reveals God to us. Comes through that great, wonderful first chapter of John where Christ became a human being and lived here on the earth among us and was full of loving forgiveness and truth. And in verse 18 it says, no one has ever actually seen God, but of course his only son has. For he is the companion of the Father and has told us all about him. That was his mission here, to tell us all about him and then go all the way to the cross to give his life that we might have life. That otherwise there's no way we could gain it. And thirdly, he is completely holy. Hebrews chapter 7. Listen to what this says. Verse 26, Jesus is therefore exactly the kind of high priest we need. For he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin, undefiled by sinners, and to him has been given the place of honor in heaven. He never needs the daily blood of animal sacrifices as other priests did to cover over first their own sins and then the sins of the people. For he finished all sacrifices once and for all when he sacrificed himself on the cross. Under the old system, even the high priests were weak and sinful men who could not keep from doing wrong. But later God appointed by his oath his son who is perfect forever. A marvelous passage to come to a place to where we accept, for we can never understand the holiness of God. We just come to the place where we accept the holiness of Jesus Christ. And here it is, unstained by sin. Let me tell you something. Every one of us in this place have in some way been stained by sin. We have been defiled by sinners. We can't live in this world without that. The pressure's on. And Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, continues to demonstrate his power in blinding believers to the things that they need to pay attention to and understand that as God is holy, the demand upon us is to live that holy life by walking in Jesus Christ and allowing him control in our lives. And here is the one who was unstained by sin. He's holy, he's blameless, he's undefiled by sinners. And to him was given the place of honor in heaven. You see, in in the sacrifice that he gave, I was reading Barnhouse this week, out of Romans chapter 3. And he was talking about the fact that your sin means your death or the death of a substitute. You have sinned and the scripture says that the soul that sins, it must die. We'll die because of our sins, for God is holy. However, there's a way out. That's what he talks about here in Hebrews chapter 7. That's what he talks about in Colossians chapter 1. You see, the Lord, our God, has furnished us a substitute. The Lamb, capital L, Jesus Christ, the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. He died in our place. That's the picture of the fact that God came to earth through the Lord Jesus Christ and was wounded for our transgressions, Isaiah 53, and bruised for our iniquities. He died for us. Sin means death. Sin means death. Sin means our death or the death of the Savior, for he is the only substitute. 
And then Barnhouse says this, but now that Christ has died, that object lesson meant to teach the infant race of the vicarious, substitutionary atonement provided by the Savior is manifested as revealing the righteousness of God apart from the law. All those people that say, I try to keep the Ten Commandments. You may try, friend, but you're doomed because you can't. Those people that say, I try to live by the golden rule. You try, but you don't quite make it. That's why it's important for us to understand we need righteousness without the law. Christ has died, therefore there is a righteousness without works, a righteousness without law, a righteousness without character, a righteousness without effort, a righteousness imputed and imparted solely on the basis of the essential grace of God. And what he is, is Christ. He is our righteousness. Our earthly righteousness and character will grow out of this. And that's why we ask you to come to Jesus Christ. That's why I ask you as believers to come to that place of allowing yourself to so totally be consumed by the message of Colossians 1, that he is the Savior. He is the one that established our relationship with God Almighty and our earthly righteousness and our earthly character will grow out of this as we come to that place of embracing this truth. Now, there are just two kinds of people sitting here. Some of you that have known the Lord for a long or a short time, and yet you look at your Christian life, struggling, scrambling, in your attitude toward life, in your situation at home, in your, in your situation, wherever it may be, here you are struggling, struggling, struggling without that ability to say, Lord, I know I'm in the right place and I'm doing the right thing. I know that. Roberta and I had dinner this last week with a young couple that are running Youth for Christ in the Central Coast area. Daryl and Joni Jansen, known him a long time. DJ used to work for Clippy and got a lot of his early training there. The ministry's going great. He said, man, we're in a war. Daryl had taken a leave from Youth for Christ and had gone to Nebraska to farm and saw some tremendous things happen there and loved raising his kids on a farm. And after four or five years, he said, it's time to get back in the front lines. And the call came to Central Coast Youth for Christ, and he and Joni have answered it. And the ministry continues to roll. But the finances have just been pathetic in that place. And various people have stepped up and said, I'm going to put X amount of dollars, large money, in to help pull things up. And it doesn't happen. And over and over again, there have been these promises. And they've taken every bit of savings they had when they left the farm. Every last bit of it to take care of their family needs. As I looked at him across the dinner table, I said, what's your plan? <laughs> he said, what's my plan? He said, I have no release from God to leave this place. God has called me to minister. And by his grace, we will stay and expect that one day he'll bring sufficient funds to cover the needs. It's an exciting thing in a day and age where everybody's scrambling and grabbing to get all they can to be with young people who are that committed to Jesus Christ, who acknowledge the call of God, who understand there's no other way out. He thought he had a great fundraiser. I'll tell you this one story and I'll let you go. 
couple of places in California doing a thing called the maze for profit. And they build this maze and you pay money to get in there and try to go through it and figure how to get through it. It's a great fun kid thing and they're, they're just rolling in the money. And Daryl's a good operator and he thought, boy, that's a good thing, that'll be great. Went through all the business of getting it set up on the beach, down at Avila Beach. Got all the okays and you go through government control and, and finally get, got all of that and figured, well, here we are. Boy, this is gonna do it. Two radio stations, the kind the kids listen to, the crowd you gotta get to to make a thing like that go. They came out to look at it and their people went through the maze, thought it was terrific. Boy, they came out, they were excited. Can we get an exclusive on this thing? And finally they said, what are you raising this money for? What is this thing called campus life? Daryl said, well, it, we're telling kids about Jesus Christ. And you're doing what? We're telling kids about Jesus Christ and what he can do when he's in charge in their lives. He said, Buf, they'd been there 45 minutes. They'd gone through the maze. They were thoroughly excited. They were planning to run big contests, a lot of noise on the radio. They were gonna bring thousands of kids to that thing. And he said, from the time I mentioned the name of Jesus Christ till they were packed up with all their gear and gone was less than five minutes. Never heard another word from them, not a peep. He said, I don't know what all this means, but I know one thing. We're here and we're gonna stay and do the work and the will of God because there's only one message that will change young people's lives and that's the message of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Now to you believers, I want you to be involved in prayer for yourselves but also for that ministry that God will open the windows of heaven and unload the money to keep that thing moving. To those of you that don't know Jesus Christ, because that's the only other crowd that's in here, you've never honestly submitted yourself to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You find yourself thinking maybe you're good enough or trying to be good enough. There's no way. Our goodness is in Him. And without Him, we have no goodness. And if we can help you come to Christ, there's a card in the rack in front of you. You can pull that out and fill it out and put it in one of these boxes around the walls. We'll get it and somebody will be sitting with you this week with a Bible to show you exactly how you can become a member of the family of God. You've got your assignment. You know who you are. Make the moves you need to make to be a part of doing the work of God and allowing God to do his work in you first. Stand with me. Let's pray. Father, accept our thanks this morning. Simple and yet totally honest thanks for the person of Jesus Christ. As I listen to this group singing these songs today that tied so neatly to the message, so beautifully woven together with what we're doing here today, my prayer is that believers would go out of here saying I am going to reaffirm my faith in this Christ as the only way of salvation. And I will get locked into the spiritual battle that's going on to pray on behalf of DJ and Joni and the staff at Central Coast YFC. And if God moves them to do more than pray, like to give, May they respond to that. And then I think of people here who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, have kind of faked some kind of commitment, have never really gotten in touch with what the scripture has to say. My prayer is that they would acknowledge their need, examine the scripture, would ask for help, would pull that card out and fill it out and ask for the help to come to know Jesus Christ, that we can bring them simply because we know the word. Bless us as we go to class. 
blesses as we buy tickets for a barbecue, thinking in terms of ministry and witness to those who need to get on these grounds. Help us, dear Father. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Thank you so much. You got plenty of time. Get a cup of coffee. Get to class. Get your tickets bought. Say howdy to a friend. Thank you.